Well, hello all. I hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. Um, I want to do a little video today on the fantasy trip. Quite a few people have asked me to do some more on it. I know that those of you who followed me on it am aware that both I like it and the fact that I have consistently used it since 1980. And it's a fun game system, and it has a lot of good things going for it. Much more detailed skirmish-type battles, I think, than D&D. &D. Uh, much bloodier. It also depends on armor to stop damage instead of your armor class making you more difficult to hit. Something that I appreciate. And some of the greatest adventures I've ever had have been in this system, so it has a lot of emotional attachment to me to play. But the more I read it, the more I do and find that some of the changes they've made have been really beneficial. So I like it. So let's go ahead and start to delve into it here and see how I generate characters and how I recommend you guys get started on it. Uh, there's a lot to it. Now, I think it's nice to have a game set of rules that you can beat somebody with if they try to steal your toilet paper. So it's had some dual use. This was the game system that created my 3x5 card system. And the real reason is because the, everything that you could need for your characters, you could pretty much put on a 3x5 card. And that's how we did it. And the more we did the 3x5 cards, the more we found we really liked it. It was easy, uh, it was portable graph paper where I could do entire dungeons on 3x5 cards. And that worked out pretty nice. Now, I don't recommend a full-blown dungeon on a 3x5 card. I still like to do those on a big three-ring binder type thing for multiple levels. But large dungeons like the 70 styles are things you're going to run um, for a long period of time. And they're going to evolve and change as you play. So usually I find that it's better to have a large piece of graph paper and it allows you to have a larger area of the dungeon available for you to sort of help run the game. Of course, I recommend, of course, is the Almighty Graph Paper, the little graph paper for the 3x5 card or little Minion Adventures. And normally when I run uh, adventures for almost any game now, just where it's going to be a you know four or five room uh, little location, um, I tend to use 3x5 cards. I run all my monsters on 3x5 cards, so I'll have them easily accessible. One big dungeon, two other smaller adventures kept in the box, so that if anyone goes off the rails, you're ready to go, then design your first adventure, or use my first Twilight of a Fae adventure, where they kidnap the kids and they run them out to try to take them and turn them into elves. So whatever's in the mood for you, uh, I think you should do, but now I wanted to go ahead and delve a little bit more into the fantasy. Okay. Well, here is where we have the main Bible to the fantasy trip, and it's in the labyrinth. Now, in the labyrinth has your character generation, the skills and spells, talents and abilities that you can take. Uh, it has a bestiary of some sort. I mean, I really was hoping that Steve Jackson would let me create a uh, full bestiary. But there really is enough here to keep you going. And once you understand the basic components of the game and how everything works, it's very easy to convert creatures from almost any game system over into the fantasy trip. And that's one of the things I've really, really liked. The fact that I've had no difficulty in having people who've come out of Dungeons and Dragons or any other game system and have them be able to play, understand, and then face the monsters that exist within other game systems, doing the monsters justice. So, to that end, I don't think you're going to have an issue. The other thing about it is, is a lot of the ways they present the monsters as is if they were characters. So, if you want to run a goblin character, or maybe a minotaur character, or something else, they give you the basic framework so you can do that. If you want to give your creatures additional abilities, you can do that. And I do that often. It's so much more bare bones, a lot like older Dungeons and Dragons, that there is so much more up to the control of the game master than being sort of um, hamstrung by the detailed rule books into having to do things a certain way. The other thing about the fantasy trip and what I like, this makes it really easy for you to create a character of your own design. However you envision your character to be, it really can be done in this game system fairly easily. The other thing that's nice, uh, they've given you 
uh, a way to generate magical items, which I think is pretty efficient, a way to then sell magical items, which I think is useful. They also give you a jobs table. So if you have players that might disappear for two or three or four sessions, all you have to figure out is how many weeks that is when they get back. They can roll on the jobs table based upon their abilities and the like. So they can get uh, some additional coin. They can get uh, some additional experience if you want. They can get a promotion. Because I still think a lot of this is better if the game masters have some control. They have a, a critical role. So if they roll critically, um, you can give them something even more special, which I, again, figure that should be things like uh, maybe experience or a level or however you want to run your game. Maybe they find a magical item. They also have a fumble table. If they make the fumble roll, then they have to roll four dice of damage against their characters to see if they survive. So it's very possible that your characters, if they use the jobs table, can get killed um, between adventures. And that's what I liked about this situation. They give you a world map of their very own and a little history of their background. I think a lot of different game systems out there can be easily converted to the fantasy trip. Even especially GURPS, which was what Steve Jackson did after he could not acquire the rights to this game system, he basically made uh, In the Labyrinth or the Fantasy Trip 2.0, where he added an additional stat and he modified some things up and he did what I actually hated in the game is he gave advantages and disadvantages to the characters. Now, what I obviously found in that is that characters would take some weak and uh, obtuse disadvantages to allow them to have extra points to buy really, really bitchin' advantages. The thing that was really nice in the new expansion is they gave this out too, which was a really, really nice put-together and detailed Dungeon Master screen. It's a really enjoyable item. It's got lots of really cool stuff in it. They have, like, maps and all the basic options. So... All you need to have is this, and you can pretty much run the entire game with this. Because almost every question, I would say a good 90% of the rules you'd ever use are going to be on this screen, and you're not going to have to delve in into any of the books to go answer questions about what works and what doesn't work. That was really effective. So once you've decided what your world is and what your campaign is, I am going to suggest you do not start with starting characters. Starting characters are 32 points. Most humans are 888 plus 8 uh, additional skill points to be put between their strength, dexterity, and intelligence. From that, you determine what weapons you can carry, how you well you're able to hit based upon your dexterity, less your armor penalties. Um, your intelligence, which will determine what levels of talents and skills you have and or how many magical abilities you have. Now, there's not really a whole lot of difference between elves and dwarves and humans in this, but you can add things. In the original rules, they had some individual talents for dwarves and halflings that were more advantageous than what's now in the uh, revised rules. But I think they were trying to make it so that there was not a absolutely discernible better advantage to have a non-human than to have a human. Um, but I think it's up to you. Again, when you are designing it, I think you should use what you like and modify things by racially so that the characters are not all uh, discernibly the same. But going with the basic rules at this point, I generated a 34-point hero. Again, he's two points higher than what the starting role-playing character would be. The reason I did that is, A, you're going to get a lot of chance to play the little 32-point characters, and you play Death Test, and some of the content that's given to you in the game, and you'll be able to battle with your friends and learn the rules, and it's perfectly good to do that with 32-point characters. But what happens is they tend to be more generic. You, you tend to, like, default to the basic stuff uh, more because you pretty much have to. When you get them into experience, they start acquiring items a little differently. So this is Duran. He's 34 points. Normally, he would have been sort of a 12-12-8 character if he was 32 points. Um, he more than likely would have leather, not chainmail. I would have kept him at the same dexterity. And he would have had basic skill fighting weapons, which are pretty much what he has. But by making him 9, um, and then gave him a better dexterity, which allowed me to move him up to chainmail, uh, which I like. So he's got chainmail and a small spike shield. And he was able to buy level 1 toughness. Now, I like that a lot. Level 1 toughness gives you another reduction in damage based upon... Um, 
you know, you're what you're hit by. And that's again the thing about this game that makes it very different. So as you can see, his armor class is four, which means no matter what, he stops four points of damage. If he's in one of his front hexes and he has his small shield with him, he's going to start up an additional point of damage to five points of damage. Now, in a game where a really good weapon does two dice of damage, um, a lot of lighter weapons are going to do one die of damage or one plus one or one plus two. Um, you can see that this guy is a pretty big stud muffin. The chainmail reduces his movement to six from ten, so that was a bit of a down. So this guy's not going to be running away as much. He's more of my kind of character that sort of kind of holds the line. Um, and to that end, his two hit is not particularly great. Now, if he does switch to his crossbow, uh, he has a level one missile weapon, which gives him a plus one with missile weapons. So if it gets into a long range duel, he does have a light crossbow and, um, he can use it effectively. Actually, in many ways, more effectively than he can fight with his melee weapon. His job is to protect the less armored combatants that are in his party. Other really good character designs are characters that have pole weapons. Pole weapons are very effective in this game. Uh, if you charge with them, you get to go off before other meleeers. Uh, charge attack gives you an advantage in that. You get a dexterity plus in a charge, and you do an additional 1d6 plus 1 damage in a charge. Um, that's really nice. It allows you an opportunity to really do a lot of damage right off the bat. A lot of times with pole weapon guys, you'll see them with very high strength carrying very large pole weapons, and then the rest of it's going to go into dexterity. The idea is to strike first, don't miss, hit them very hard and either reduce their dexterity or knock them down or kill them outright. Archers are very good to obviously shoot things from long range. They're very effective. But the thing to remember in this game, which you may not aware, be aware of uh, if you've never played it, is it's very, very dangerous to shoot missile weapons through hexes that have your friends in them. You are substantially more likely to hit your friend than you are um, potentially the enemy. If you roll to miss and you fail, you've hit your friend. If you do so at a fumble, you could be doing double damage, triple damage. And I can tell you in many cases uh, for people who are novices, they have killed their um, their friends outright with a missed arrow shot. So the thing to do is if you're going to shoot arrows, you kind of want to move around on the fringe, uh, try to make sure you have a clear line of sight to wherever your target is, and then shoot them dead. And that is a very flavor portion of this game system versus other game systems. The other good thing to have are magic users. Now I'm going to show you a monster. Since, um, a lot of times when you're designing monsters as a, as a DM, uh, this is a goblin shaman boss. Goblins are normally 32 points as well. Um, giving him the extra two points, he started out as 10, 13, 11. No armor, of course. He's got a movement of 10, which is the basic movement. Goblins are fairly effective. They have no other abilities or skills. They allow you, if you want to, modify to do that. Um, but I don't. I think goblins are your sort of standard matchups against standard beginning level heroes. Now, in this case, I gave him literacy for one. Um, I paid the double points to give him priest. Now, Steve Jackson does not give priest really anything. He doesn't like clerics. I don't think he is a highly religious individual on his own. And I think that he feels that people uh, should allow the game masters to decide what, if anything, the priests can do to modify the game. But he thinks they should be minor so they don't directly uh, change the concept uh, and, and make the priests as dominant as they might be in other game systems. So what I did with this character is I made him a wizard. Since I paid double for the priest skill, and what I did, it once per round, they could transfer damage they receive to an adjacent goblin. That's kind of right out of the old D&D 4th edition type thing, where the boss could transfer damage to one of his minions. I like that. I thought it was a really good deal. Uh, most human clerics that I allow people to take, and this is again a house rule for me, is I give them a healing ability that they can make an intelligence roll to get a d6 of healing on their, on their allies. I think that's pretty important because this really is a game of the quick and the dead. Uh, you will find because of the technical elements of the game, uh, characters can go down, especially early in the campaign, very, very quickly. And, you know, your hits are tough to get back. 
and healing potions, which you can buy, are expensive. Then, of course, what I gave to the character were spells. Now, the spells are listed down below. Now, there are different types of spells. There are throne spells that I put a T by. There are creation spells, um, obviously, which are what I a T by. The fires, I'm sorry, the fire is a creation spell. Staff is a special spell, which means it's normally done outside of gameplay. Again, creation spell shadow, uh, we had other things, speed movement, which was a throne spell, and I thought that would be very interesting if you want this boss to run away. The idea that I always love is make your big protagonists of players um, minor minions, so that if the players got into a battle with this goblin shaman's little band of gallows, uh, they would then flee when uh, they had to, because goblins are not that fearless, and the goblin shaman has the ability to throw a speed spell on himself and really make a run for it, and hopefully get away. Rope and sleep are both great spells. The rope is creation, which means it's easier to cast, uh, but has a very limited range. The sleep spell has a longer range. It's also very effective, but it's minus one for each hex you're throwing it, which means realistically to have a good chance of it getting off, uh, you're going to have to be fairly close. Um, he has a magical staff, and the second level mana staff on top of his basic staff, uh, this was not in the original game. This came into the new game, and I really, really like it. It allows wizards to create a staff. What the mana staff does is once he builds it, he can spend experience points to permanently increase the staff. At this point, I had him spend 200 XP to raise one mana. Now, he can raise it up to his, his int. In this case, he could have had a plus 11 mana staff, but it would have cost a lot of experience points. And which, of course, he doesn't have at low level. Uh, but I thought he might have been able to put one point into it. That gives him an additional mana point to use, which means that he can cast one without expending any points. And these points here are reductions in strength. Now, the blur takes one plus one point per every turn to maintain it. Now, Blur's pretty nice. It makes you minus four to hit with spells and weapons, which means that if you can get a Blur up, especially on a fighter who might uh, be up front, who could be doing a lot of damage, if he was like a special character, uh, you can make him really pretty tough. The problem being, it's quickly you're going to run out of strength, which means you're going to either pass out or have to drop the spell at some point to do anything else. As you can see, there's other spell points required to cast these spells, it's more likely the Goblin Shaman's going to try to do that. Now, the God of Battle spell used to be the One Hex Fire. Once you were in it, it would eventually burn you to death. But now it doesn't do that. If you have more than two points of armor, you can pretty much stand in a fire spell. Uh, Shadow's interesting. Uh, minus four to attack into it, but minus six to attack out of it. Rope's a great spell. Reduces your dexterity immediately and then reduces it by minus one every turn. Very effective uh, against uh, a very nasty opponent. Uh, sleeps the same way, puts you out. These don't work as effective if you're running against large monster or like uh, a, a clerical type character. So his spells are all supportive of the group. He has lock knock. So if the opponents try to, you know, pinion a door to, to keep the goblins out, he can open it. Um, yeah, it's a fun little character. But again, this is how magic users work. Put a dot on the very front of your figure. That way there'll be no indication, you know, doubt, no doubt of the indication of which way he is facing. So in this case, if you were looking at your character, uh, this is your front, so these are front, front, front. If the enemy are here, this would be side and side. And if your enemy gets to here, you're, uh, they're on your rear. That's gonna be very bad. So often what you'll see in situations like this is that, you know, the monsters are going to want to get up here. And if they can, you know, they're going to want to shift onto your sides and backs. It's an interesting thing. On the movement phase, if you are engaged, you may shift a space. This is what makes this game substantially very tactical. In the beginning of the game, when you're having it down at the beginning of each round, you have the leader of your human party roll an initiative. Now, there are skills that modify initiative, and those are beneficial. The person who rolls, whoever wins, can determine if their party is going to move first or if the enemy are going to move first. If there is no leader or if there's dissent amongst the ranks, then what can happen is you can say the leader has lost you know, uh, focus or the people have lost faith in the leader, and now everybody can roll their own individual uh, initiative in the party. Um, 
that's not a bad thing to do. The problem with that is you might have characters who have very bad initiatives who are going to get stuck. And it slows down gameplay dramatically when you have like five or six characters who are rolling individual initiatives. But let's just stay for the sake of argument we're doing this and we're going to have a party initiative. Now, we have our little party of adventurers here. Let's put something together. We got a little fighter and we have a second little baby roguey guy. And I say a magic user and an archer, all important. There's four characters. but That's not an uncommon party, um, as you guys who play D&D. And in this case, Evil Jim has thrown, say, five little goblins, starting goblins. They're 32 points. Uh, they're not bad, but they're not great. And the little leader goblin priest here. So, the first thing that happens in a, in a game battle is we roll the initiative. And it, it doesn't make any difference. We'll say in this case, uh, there's no skill set that any of these humans have. Uh, they don't have uh, tactics uh, so or strategists. So, those are the ones that would give you advantage. So, they roll. In this case, let's say the humans win. Now, they look at the situation and they go, well, the archer goes, okay, you're in charge. What do you think? We should go first or second? Well... Um, we're outnumbered. So the problem with being outnumbered is it's very kind of easy uh, to get flanked. The other thing about it is goblins, in this particular case, are not well armed. So their movement is a full 10. That means they can move five spaces and still make a charge attack. Now, and everything in the combat after we have the determination of movement is based upon dexterity. So let's just say for the sake of argument, the humans go, you know what, guys, you move first. Well, the goblins are going to take full advantage of that. One, two, three, four, five. They're going to try to shift around since they they have an advantage in numbers. They also want to protect their little priest. So one, two, three, four, five. Now they've put this person in peril, as you can see right now, that he is going to have to give someone, if they get on all these spaces, aside. Well, the goblins, especially this pull weapon user, he's going to charge. And he's actually going to charge right to the front because he kind of thinks he's smarter than everyone else. One, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five. Now you have to declare this goblin goes front front, front. That way, if this character, and let me try it for this side, this goblin here will declare front, front, and front. That means if this character who's now engaged cannot make a long movement, he could shift to there and get on the goblin's uh, front only. If the goblin was facing this direction, he could shift and get on his side, which meant the goblin could not attack him and he would get a plus two on any attack against the goblin. Now, and since this case is a mage, it's not a really big problem. The goblin still has potential problem on this unengaged archer, but it's an archer and he doesn't figure it's going to go on to get into melee. Again, this goblin is going to go front, front, front. Not going to make any difference here. And these guys are all going to be facing front on this one here. That's a really good thing for them. Now, a clear, the priest can only move one space and cast a spell. So he's only going to move one because there is a spell that he wants to try to cast. And this battle, as you see, is going to, you know, get fun very quick. The humans now, it's their turn. They have movement. Since the characters are engaged, there's not a whole lot of movement they can do. Engaged character can shift. He could shift away from here. I don't know whether that's necessarily going to help this fighter. This fighter is the one who has the most problem. So he's going to stay here, hoping the idea that he will draw the attack from this goblin. And if not, maybe be a higher dexterity and be able to get this guy and kill it before it has a chance to strike at this warrior. Uh, the spearman's going to attack first because he's charging. He's got a pole weapon, kind of a big advantage. This guy's declared. So the human says, well, the most danger I have is from this pole weapon. So I want it on my front, 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 front. Nothing much I can do about all of this, but... I'm trying to hope that this guy will, will help out here and get this one. This one's going to stay here. This character then goes front, front. He goes to here. He'll switch to here. No reason not to. Front, front, front. Not a real big deal, but in future rounds, it may become something. Well, now I may have an advantage here. So this guy's in danger. Uh, the archer moves two spaces and says, maybe I can help here. So it moves to here. Readies. I believe an archer can move two spaces. Might only be able to move one. So it's not going to make a difference. In this case, I'm I'm going to allow... In fact, you know what? I'm going to check the rules. Hold on. Missile weapon attack. Move up to one hex and or drop to prone or slash kneeling position and or fire a missile. So to uh, the situation. Assuming that, uh, again, our fighters are going to be pretty much armed as equipped, uh, they're pretty light. The goblins are, again, pretty light, but our fighter has the dexterity advantage. So it would go by dexterity. Our two fighters who are unarmored have high dexterities. They don't they don't have a whole lot else going for them, but they do have an ability to get their attacks off 
uh, quicker uh, than the goblins do. The best thing about it is our archer here has the really best dexterity because it's taken missile weapons at level three. Now I'm just pulling this out of air because I know the rules. The the elf fires first, got a plus three because it has missiles, so it fires at 16. This goblin can change his orders. He goes, I could change and dodge. And the reason he would want to do that is not try to catch an arrow. But let's assume that he's a goblin. He's not thinking as smartly as he could. So he's going to attack because they got the advantage here on this guy. So this guy fires, he hits, he rolls damage. Does uh, enough damage to get a negative two penalty on this goblin. It did not kill it outright. But the goblin now has a penalty against this character, so it drops, you know, more dramatically. The archer, uh, I believe, has the skill to fire a second arrow, which will do at the end of the round. Then it goes to the abilities. The human's next. Well, he's got a wounded goblin here that likely may not hit him, so he's going to try to help his friend out and attack here. Well, once again, this goblin sees that this is a, a bloody situation, and he has a plus two for the side, but still that comes to be the same. Being the same, you roll off. And let's just say our friend here is lucky enough. He is now still first. He's going to attack the goblin. He rolls to attack. Uh, he doesn't have an advantage, but he rolls sufficiently high enough to hit. He has a two-die weapon. He attacks, doing enough damage again to give this goblin a negative two on the attack. So now the goblin attacks the warrior. But before he attacks, the, or once he starts to attack, the human goes, wait, 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 wait. I'm attacking with four people. I'm not going to attack. I'm going to defend. Defend now allows him to just put up a straight defense, losing his attack, but everyone who is attacking him needs to roll four dice to hit him. Much more difficult to do. They have to roll four dice. Let's assume that for the sake of argument that all the goblins have failed, but one, uh, the one that was very important was not to get hit by the spear unit, who didn't hit him, because had this guy hit him um, with a javelin, it would have been one minus one for the javelin, plus one plus one for the charge, he'd have been doing a two dice straight hit. On a character with no armor, very likely uh, to at least give him a major penalty, kill him outright, or at least knock him down. The wizard here casts the spell, uh, assuming it, it succeeds. Uh, and let's say he now sleeps this goblin. Another thing that would have been really great in this situation, if there had been maybe a higher dexterity on this wizard, is to put a blur. There's so many things, and I don't need to get into all kinds of tactics with you, but the idea that you are look at the tactical situation in the battle. And this game is substantially more tactical than Dungeons & Dragons, because even high-level characters in this game do not have a ton of hit points. They really have their armor, their magic, their high dexterities, and their good strengths, and their skills to, to beat the opponents. As the opponents get bigger and badder and nastier, they don't have this huge number of hit points. A lot of times, a, a large group of goblins can be still very dangerous to opponents, because if you roll a three, you've done triple damage. If you roll a four, you've done double damage. Now, you can imagine uh, an orc with a spear or even maybe a polearm that's doing two dice. It attacks. If it rolls a three, it automatically hits. And it's now going to do nine dice plus three. Um, you can kind of guess that's going to likely kill most characters outright. Um, that's why you have to find ways to eventually revivify your characters uh, in the magical settings, because there are lots of things that will happen in this game to kill characters. And they're the exception, not the rule, and there may be ways to avoid it with magic and other types of things, but believe me, it is a very dangerous game system, substantially more than Dungeons and & Dragons, and it's very fluid in that the battles are not going to be long. They're going to, like I said, be the quick and the dead. You're not going to have a, a, a warrior with 100 hit points who's being hit by a D8 plus 3 weapon and sit there and watch this battle go on. Battles in this game tend to be very quick. And the great thing about that is why I loved it is because they were fast, they allowed large, large amount of, of characters and large amounts of enemies. But when you always have that critical hanging over your head, it's a big deal. In a battle we had in, a, in an undead lair, which was this undead tower where the tower itself was made out of living bones that were trying to grab the characters and, and hold them in place and slow their movement. I had all these archers on the higher rings of this tower firing down. Now they stunk. They were terrible. They were basic starting first level skeletons, but they all had a bow and they were all rolling to hit. And if they rolled a three or a four, they're doing triple or double damage. 
That's getting through the armor, slowly whittling down the heroes. And they're having to use their healing potions and all that. It made it substantially more dangerous. Quantity has a quality of its very own. And that's important to understand in this game. The game is, is meant to be quick. The characters have to play smart. If you get yourself well separated from your party, where they're not able to cover your back, or if you start taking casualties, the game can really go against you very quickly. This magic user here, he might have some abilities that can sort of, uh, you know, really, you know, fix the, the game and play. And since these guys don't have armor, a 1x fire would be very effective in them. They can't sit in it because they're going to be taking two points of damage every turn. You know, it's a problem. They're going to have to move and disengage. The battle then stays fluid. And again, with initiatives, you've got to be careful on where you're going to be the next round because you don't want creatures to be able to then shift onto your side and you not able to do anything about it. Now, one thing you can't do uh, in the game is you cannot shift away. I think I cheated there a bit. You cannot shift away from a character if you're in their front hex. You can only shift away if they're in a side hex. Other than that, you're engaged and you would have to disengage. All of this I can leave to you. You can sit and play and understand uh, how the game works. What I would suggest you do is generate... 34-point uh, characters. Uh, we have started with 36-point characters. We have started with 40-point characters. Now, I think 34 is the best start for novice players because, A, it allows their characters to have lots of sort of individual ability that they can start with. They can make them very interesting and substantially more interesting than a 32-point character. It gives them lots of room to grow. So as for Durin, I showed you, he actually only used eight of his nine potential intelligent points for his skills. Now, I could have given him literacy. I could have given him recognized value or anything like that. But I didn't do it because I don't want to have to unlearn those skills. Now, a toughness two that requires a 14 strength. My feeling with this character is his first two points of development are going to be in strength and strength. That will bring him up to a 36-point character. It will then give him a 14 strength, which allows him to make toughness two. Toughness two means he'll stop five points straight, six points with his armor, and this makes him even a more tough character. 36-point characters have a real quandary whether to add to the statistics, which he needs to do, or they can, for 500 points, buy a one-point skill. And that's constant. That did not exist in the original rules either. And I think that's a good, a good rule to have here. So once you've acquired statistics that you're happy with, you're going to then be pouring points into buying skills. And since it's cheaper than advancing, um, it will not be uncommon to see characters that once they're set, are going to have a great deal of skills to add. So it's not necessary all the time for you to throw out monsters that deal multiple dice of damage. Now, later on, that'll change. Um, you'll find characters acquire cool magical items. And if you're like me and you love to give away lots of magical items, it's going to be uh, much sooner than later. But I think that's the thing. You can give away really powerful items here without completely and utterly unbalancing the game. The thing to remember here, too, you're going to have a much more tactical situation on the board. Thinking is going to be something very important to do. We work as a team. We win as a team. If you get a lot of individuals who can't necessarily work as a team, it's very likely they're going to end up uh, dead. And since I said it's not that hard, uh, you get two or three creatures on an individual who is separated from a party. It's not going to be difficult for one of them to be able to shift on to at least a side, if not a rear. Then the heroes become much more vulnerable. Um, if you have effectively nastier monsters, they can make aim shots and all kinds of things that can really uh, end the game for the hero. So it's fun. My suggestion is if you have it, uh, start playing the death test and the little things that they gave you. So use some of the basic standard characters that are there so you can see strengths and weaknesses. There is a great strength for armor, but the great thing is when you start to play, let your players step up to 34-point characters. In my humble opinion, it makes for a much more enjoyable role-playing experience, and your characters are still going to move ahead quickly. Um, up to the next levels, and it's still going to allow you to give them a more interesting challenge than you will if you play the straight 32-point game. Uh, the characters then are more, like I say, more interesting, and they can accept more dangerous foes. 
So I hope this is a little bit of help. Uh, you've got a lot of the tools now that I use. Again, feel free to modify things as you see fit. Um, start to maybe play with the idea of bringing Dungeons and Dragons type monsters into this game once you've uh, you know got tired of just fighting the basic goblins and orcs and ogres and, and things that they give you. As far as an effective game system, this is really so. Once uh, the players have sort of mastered the strategy concept, it is a very easy game for a multiple things. Because of the 3x5 and the few stats required, it's not uncommon for most of my games for players to run at least two characters. This allows very large fun battles. It allows more versatility. It allows characters to sort of have a fallback strategy. There's things there that you, you don't necessarily get with playing the five characters. You can have characters that cover each other on different skills. And of course, that allows you to run larger monsters. And since the battles are quick, you can get away with this. So, you know, a large battle of, say, 10 characters versus 15 or 20 bad guys um, is not going to take the whole adventure. Where in a Dungeons & Dragons type battle, that might be the whole thing. And... It's very nice to see how your players will get their creativity going to do mix and matches with the various abilities to build their own types of warriors. You can get warriors that are going to look very different from one another, and I guarantee you will. A fighter is not a fighter is not a fighter in this game system. They can be very much custom made. So if you have it, start looking at it, start thinking about running it. Uh, maybe I might do some mambos uh, down the road. In fact, I think I might be using Fantasy Trip for maybe half my mambos instead of D&D. That way you can sort of see how I have to stay with the tactics much more um, than I would if I was playing the open Dungeons and Dragons system. I think this video has gone on for way longer than I want it, so I'm going to cut it short now and say thank you very much. I hope you guys are feeling good. Um, remember, if you're, if you're feeling depressed and alone and shut in, you know, draw some maps and read some books. There's lots of great things to be run and think about, um, about running your own adventures. And, you know, if nothing else, go online and listen to some other people talking about the game. There's a lot of people out there who've got a lot of great experience in painting and DMing and everything else. So hope everything's great for everyone. Fight to me, devil's fight for I hate peace. Game on, everyone. Talk to you soon.